Welcome everyone back to The Hot Slice. I'm creative director Josh Cowan. And I'm executive editor Denise Greer. Denise, we have arrived at episode six of The Hot Slice, so that's pretty amazing. We're no longer a new podcast, I think. I think that puts us into a new level. Right. And today I'm very excited uh, to have our guest, the 2020 Young Entrepreneur of the Year, Rocky Schenauer. And what an amazing guy. I mean, he has built a just a phenomenal pizzeria and actually pizza company in um, the middle of Ohio. Yeah, we we took a road trip there last year. Um, Myself, you, and it was Katie's first trip to a pizzeria. It was about a four hour drive. Uh, You know, it probably could have been shorter, but we get behind quite a few Amish. (laughs) Amish (laughs) buggies. So it's probably almost like three and a half, but yeah, it took us about four, a little over four. Uh, but it was a beautiful trip, great trip. And when I was there, when I was actually, when we walked away from, from Rocky, uh, from, from, uh, Park street, I was so inspired, you know, there, there are like a, a, a handful that, you know, over the years that, have, but it's that, that one right there inspired me more than most any of them. It's, it was amazing. Yeah, I, I agree, you know, and you know, there's something about building what he has been able to build in such a small community. Right. You know, that, I mean, that, that just blows me away. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in a town about the size of Sugar Creek. So to see, see what he has and like to see what, you know, what could, what could be in a town that size. So inspiring. Yeah. And, and he, so he's one of these guys that is a big picture kind of kind of guy. Um, so he's looking at, you know, he is always looking at evaluating his business and how can he improve and how can he grow his business and how can he think about, you know, elevating and leading his team. Um, and so he is definitely one that I think people will love to hear from. All right. So without any further ado, let's get into the Rocky Schenauer episode. Hey everyone, it's Katie, art director at Pizza Today, here to interrupt your podcast with a short commercial break. Your friends at Message on Hold are happy to introduce our voiceover IP service. Message on Hold Phones is our solution for phone service. If the internet goes down, it's no problem. You can still take online and phone orders. No busy signal ever. Professionally recorded, customized messaging for your business ensures that your customer gets the message that you want delivered to them every time. Save money and get new phones. Visit www.messageonholdservice.com slash phones. And now, back to the slice. Welcome to the Hot Slice. Today we have with us our 2020 Young Entrepreneur of the Year, Rocky Shanauer. Rocky, welcome to the Hot Slice. Hey, thanks so and much for having me. Actually, you know, you just you just got under that wire. You, you know, you just had turned 40 last week. So happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> he, he just slid in right thanks, underneath. Thanks it. for mentioning that. I really appreciate 40, that. 40 was a, 40 was a great year for me. 41, not so much, but I guess I'm just like a good on the even years, but so 40 was a great year for me. <laughs> so good far, deal. So good good deal. So Denise, let's get into it. All right, let's get into it. I, I got to say, congratulations on young entrepreneur of the year. You kind of knocked it out of the park uh wow you, um, you blew us away when we were you know you. sitting in our conference room uh looking at all the submissions we had a bunch of great submissions and but we when we saw your video we just looked at each other like just blown away well thank you that's <clears throat> yeah we took it seriously because uh i've been you know paying attention to this uh contest for the last couple of years really respect the folks that have been a part of it and I was just really excited because I knew this was the last year that I had a chance to even be a part of it. And I feel like I am a young entrepreneur because I started so young, but I mean, I'm, I'm kind of deep in my career now. I'm 17 years into uh, running my business and, and developing our organizations. So I don't feel like a young entrepreneur, but uh, I did sneak in just under the wire. So <laughs> Super excited about that. Yeah. And you, um, you know, we've actually been to, you know, we've been to your spot. <laughs> so that's what makes this even right. um, an interesting conversation because we can actually talk about things <clears throat> that we've seen in your operation. And, uh, you know, Josh and I were having this conversation a little earlier about the, the fact that, you know, you're, you're really kind of a systems guy. 
Um, can you give us kind of, you know, let the people know kind of a brief overview of what you have going there at Park Street and with um, Philosophy of Pi and things? Sure. So <clears throat> Courtney and I created the Philosophy of Pi as uh, kind of our corporate structure for our company a long time ago when we were just uh, a small independent little shop and we still are an independent shop but uh her and i just had a little carryout shop and um i'm really i'm really more of a big picture guy but when i have to wear all the hats i can definitely do that and so i i have a vision for what i what i want to try to continue to move forward towards and so as we grew our our single restaurant you know we started just i, I just kept problem solving and and solving these bottlenecks we would have in our restaurant and eventually it became we're a really high volume restaurant now uh how do we expand because we're doing a lot of stuff in-house and as a small little carryout shop it's really hard to have a prep kitchen out of a, a small kitchen that's designed for service and not for uh as a prep kitchen so we we created a a commissary kitchen a couple of years ago. Um, but even rewind about six or seven years before that, we started a, a mobile food truck that was that that's a wood fired pizza concept. And so we're kind of doing all of those things. And in the future, the goal is to continue to build to build concepts and to build onto what we're already doing. So Park Street Pizza is is our original restaurant and that's kind of our core core brand that we're going to expand on and so yeah it's it's been really neat because we've kind of built things backwards almost uh we started really inexperienced and started a little carryout shop and then grew that into a larger restaurant with dine-in and so we do dine-in carryout and delivery and then we started the food truck and then we started the commissary. And so we have like central, central operations there at the commissary. We've actually got our, our, uh, our offices there. So we do all of our bookkeeping and everything in house. We've got meeting facilities. We've got manager uh, offices there and our food truck is also housed there. So it's, it's pretty cool. That's kind of like the, the hub for our company to grow. I think when, when we visited, uh, like that was what I was blown away by the most was. Oh uh, yeah. It's <laughs> <Sarah>. impressive. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you could, I've never seen a commissary, a commissary like that. I mean, it was, it, it's, I mean, it's you could have a legit done. cooking school there. It was amazing. It was beautiful. Yeah. Well, the idea was if we're going to do it, we want to do it right. We don't want to, you know, just get into something. And we took a few years to actually find that location and it just worked out well because I mean, we're a small town. Sugar Creek is a small village in Ohio. And so real estate's kind of hard to come by and, but it's, it's five minutes from a restaurant and it's centrally located to areas that we want to grow, but it really works well because we, we didn't want to do something that in three or four years we were going to outgrow. We were going to wish that we had done it differently. And every, everything we do, we try to think of how it impacts our team. And so when we designed that kitchen and we designed that space, we really wanted to be <clears throat> thoughtful about how people were going to feel when they worked in there, both in the offices, when they were having meetings, when they were cooking, because recruitment and ret retaining your staff is so important. And so I believe that if you can create spaces that people want to be in, that it feels good to come to work, that it's a place that they can be proud of, it's somewhere that they want to they want to stick with you and they're willing, they see the vision with you then. And so, you know, adding, adding some design elements, like we added natural light into the kitchens uh, in both park street and at the commissary, because I don't want to work in a fluorescent, in a place that feels like right. a basement, yeah. you know? And so we just kind of think about those things and, you know, adding some, some nice design elements, like nice big wooden work tables and nice, tile walls and just places that don't feel so sterile I mean, even though they are sterile um but they feel good to be in they feel more like a kitchen that you you want to be a little at. cozier yeah. a little cozier yes and absolutely. how are you using that kitchen right now so we've got a full-time staff 
Um, we've got a manager uh, that manages the team there. Um, Courtney is our director over there. She's kind of our creative director. And so she, she works with Taylor, who is our manager, um, to really direct the team, create new. It's kind of our test kitchen, but it's also our production kitchen. So we do all of, a lot of our, um, we do all of our uh, prep for our Baylor Street wood fire truck there. We do a lot of our food prep, like um, a lot of our um, veggie prep grilling of our proteins, different things like that, making of our sauces and dressings all happens out of that kitchen and then is transported over to our main restaurant via a refrigerated yeah, van. Yeah, we got to see that refrigerated so, van before you uh, <laughs> built it out. Yeah. <laughs> that was awesome. Yes. Yeah. So, so you talk about you, your, your, you know, Sugar Creek's a small town. What's the population there? Sugar Creek has, I'm thinking between three and 4,000 wow. people. Yeah. yeah. One of the things I think that uh, impresses me a lot about what you're doing there is because, you know, we we interact with a lot of different operators and we hear about these limitations that people are putting on themselves in smaller communities. Well, you know, I'm in a small town. I can't do that like the cities are doing. I can't do this. I can't do this. Mm -hmm. And if I feel like you have been able to uh, take that and just kind of throw it aside and say, hey, you can do interesting things in a small place if it's executed well yeah so that's kind of that was kind of one of our our original ideas was you know we came from this small town we realized what we had and what we didn't have we have some great resources like farms producers we're, we're from a beautiful part of the country but we really you know courtney and i growing up there we really felt kind of bored there because there's not great restaurants there's not a lot of diversity and food and, and, uh, and cultures. And so we kind of wanted to bring the things that we were inspired by to our small town. And so we thought, you know, why not just create something that we want in our town for ourselves? If we want this, surely other people want this. And so we started to do that just, you know, in not only incorporating really good quality and seasonality to our ingredients and our menu, but also th trying to think outside of the parameters of what is a pizza shop, what is a typical pizza restaurant in this area, and try to move away from that into just trying to do other things, um, not, not other things other than pizza, but just not just the typical stuff. And so that, that was like the development of, we used to do a pizza of the month probably about 15 years ago, that was like the first thing that we did to really start experimenting with unique pizzas and seasonal menus and things like that. And that developed into a seasonal collection, which is something that our restaurant's known for, that Courtney's working on constantly developing new things. So we're always we're always unrolling something new. And that keeps people interested. Yeah, you were doing uh, farm to table seasonal menus before before it became, you know, the right. trendy, cool thing to do. Uh, We've been doing that for a long time. Absolutely. And your community sets you up perfectly for that. I mean, like I said, there's a lot of farms around there. There's a lot of a lot of stuff to choose from. So yeah, you were doing a farmer's uh, uh, a CSA drop even at your location. Is that right? A um, a farm yeah. drop. Yeah, so we have several, several, I mean, we are blessed with several really great local farms, uh, all within just a few miles of our, our restaurant and where we live. And so it's been really easy to find some really great partnerships. Sweetwater Farms, the original one um, that we probably started working with 15 years ago, and Courtney really pushed for that. And it was just a really great, a really great partnership because they've supported us so, so much. We're, we're their first priority as far as anyone. And it's it, because other restaurants in our area have seen the success we've had with that. People are clamoring, they're fighting to create these partnerships and buy locally. And, and it's, it's stemmed to a lot of other opportunities with other, other partners in the community. And we've actually just, um, I've been a part of establishing a food hub uh, with our local farmers market that has established basically a wholesale connection with local farmers to restaurants and grocery stores and other organizations and institutions. Oh, wow. 
So we've got about we've got a dozen restaurants and institutions in our county that are now buying from this food hub, which is connected to the farmer's market that we sell at with Baylor Street. And so we've negotiated with the farmers a really interesting deal. It's it's basically flat pricing for cases of of, of their produce um, that they, they sustain the whole year. So they agree upon twelve dollars a case for green peppers. That's what we that's what everybody in the in the food hub mm-hmm. pays. And doesn't matter about the fluctuation in the market. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes we pay high, sometimes we pay low, but it's a fair and agreed upon price that works for both of us. And it's been a really cool partnership. Yeah. That, you know, that's a win-win for everybody. (laughs) Yeah. You see that in large cities. Like I've seen that in uh, Minneapolis. I've seen that in New York, um, you know, where neighborhoods have gone together. Um, So to see it in a small community, that, that that's pretty impressive right there. Yeah. We're really lucky to have, you know, farms like that and and like-minded people that we can we can do that with and by no means am i taking credit for that but i'm just a part of that and so that's something that could be done all around the country you know just given the idea and just the inspiration for it absolutely hey josh you know uh when i when i think about rocky i think about us walking through his restaurant and just the amazing systems that he has in place at park street um yes. kind of what stood out to you when we when we were there well, I mean, just the details and everything, you know, it, it's like, you know, we, we go to a lot of restaurants and some, some are, you know, you can tell some are just being barely held together, but like the details and the, the flow of the employees and how they were working and the smile. I mean, I mean, I don't think they were smiling just because we were there. You can tell it was genuine. Uh, it was, it was really nice to see. Well, thank you. I mean, we, we take a lot of uh, pride in the work that we've put into trying to develop a great culture for our team, um, but also trying to just, I think it's, it's the accountability. It's the being present in your organization. That's so important. And, and really, you know, caring about the details. That's something that we've always focused on is not just getting it right and letting it go, but continuing to look at the details and continuing to try and refine things. And then just be present, be aware of, how your team's acting, how are they, how are they reacting to things? Um, how are your guests acting? And so I think because Courtney and I have always been really hands-on and even now at this point, I still work in the restaurant, but I also work on, on the Baylor street truck. We were at the farmer's market last night and, um, you know, I was stretching dough and just a part of that. And it's, it's something I really love and hope to always be connected in all of those organizations. So as we grow, that's one of my, my goals is to personally be involved in all of these locations that we have. So you really know, and you understand the pulse of not only your team, but you see the product, you get your hands on the product and you still are connecting with customers. And that allows you to understand where you're at. You know, if you get too disconnected from things and you think you have a good system, but you're not there living it, I feel like you can kind of lose sight of that and, and things, things can become unraveled. Well, you know, when we're speaking to operators, one of their, their, you know, their main pain points are, you know, building a good team. Uh, so kind of take us into like how you built the team around you. Okay. Um, so, you know, I started when I was 22 and I did not know what I was doing. I had never hired anyone. I did not know how to manage people. I can remember having my first few interviews and it was kind of like, uh, Hey, you want a job? Okay. Hey, sounds great. I need somebody. And, um, you know, I learned along the way, uh, kind of what to look for. And to, I, one of my, one of my best practices now is knowing that I want to hire people long before I need them. And this is something that I learned from a seminar going to pizza expo is, wow, I need to get ahead of this thing. I need to, be proactive about finding the right people, not, not reactive and hiring people when I'm desperate. And so it allows me to find and be selective with finding really great quality people. And the thing that I look for more than anything is personality and how they are as a person. Is this a person that, you know, one of the, one of the criteria I always use is, is this a person that I want to work with on a daily basis personally? Because I'm going to be in that restaurant, and if this person 
frustrates me, annoys me. I can't trust this person. I don't want them in my restaurant. And so that's, that's kind of helped a lot. Um, but I, I think, you know, as you, as you build a team, you get a lot, a lot of like-minded folks coming into that team because they recognize what you right. have. It's like, and as customers, I, most of the applications I'm seeing now, it's friends of employees mm -hmm. or uh, folks that are customers that have come in, they've experienced the culture as a customer, and now they want to be a part of that. And so that's really reassuring that we're doing something right. Yeah, building the culture first and everything else will follow in just nicely. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hey everyone, it's Katie, Art Director at Pizza Today, here to interrupt your podcast with a short commercial break. Figuring out how to do delivery right can be a daunting task, especially when it comes to third-party platforms, in-house delivery, contactless solutions, and POS functionality. Fortunately, the innovators at PDQ have developed the Delivery Toolkit app, a convenient single source that can measurably enhance all aspects of delivery while saving time, effort, and costs. Rooted in metrics, the multi-integrated PDQ Delivery Toolkit is a must-have resource for your store. Learn why at PDQ pdqdt.com or call 877-968-6430. That's 877-968-6430. Performance Food Service is proud to deliver high quality products, innovative technology, and custom operational solutions to restaurants of all sizes across the country. The flagship division of Performance Food Group with deep roots in the restaurant industry, Performance Food Service has been the exclusive distributor of the Roma family of brands for more than 65 years. This signature relationship has allowed Performance Food Service to become a leader in the pizza and Italian segment of food service nationwide. And now back to the slice. So how would you describe that culture? Like what, what identifies your culture? Um, if someone were to walk into your restaurant, what would they, what would they experience? Well, I, I hope that they experience positivity, uh, teamwork. I always warn people that this is a tough job. This is not an easy job. It's a very rewarding job. You'll learn and you'll grow from this job, but it's, it's not an easy job. So if you're a person that wants something easy and you just want a paycheck, please don't take this job. Um, but it's, it is rewarding. I, I, I remember when I was 16 and I started at a pizzeria, um, I, I learned a lot and I, I wasn't working in a great organization that had great culture, but it still developed me as a person. Uh, I still grew, um, you know, a, a lot of ways socially and with my communication skills. But I think, I think with this team, there's just, we have so many great leaders in the organization and we're con continuously trying to develop leadership. And so it's, it, it's just natural to find people and, and see them at 15 or 16 years old and watch them develop into 18 or 19 years old. And We've had people that have been with us from that age and they've stuck around and they've gone to college and they've, you know, stayed plugged in and it's just, it's just been really, it's been really cool. That's awesome. Um, you know, I, I think about uh, the way you want to grow your business, you know, how, how do you look at growing right now, especially given the climate that we're in of being able um, to grow your business and kind of bring those folks into the fold? That's a great question. This is a really interesting time because before pre-COVID, we actually had two new restaurant projects uh, in the works. And so we have our, our core restaurant, Park Street Pizza and Sugar Creek, and our Baylor Street uh, food truck, which does a lot of primarily catering, um, event catering, but we also do pop-ups. But uh, we were looking at turning that into a brick and mortar concept. So a wood-fired pizza restaurant and just a small intimate dining room experience. And we were, we were on track to buy a building for that. And I, I just put it on pause because a dine-in concept <laughs> in this yeah. environment is not super Ooh. attractive. And so, you know, Park Street has thrived through this whole thing. And it's really taught me a lesson in the value of, of carry out and delivery and the ability to pivot in that way. And so that's the strength of Park Street. I can remember in 2008, when the economy fell apart, we had just, we had just built our, our, our own brick and mortar uh, building for Park Street with dining room. We went from our little carry out 
place that we had rented into our own building, uh, about a 3000 square foot building with seating and everything. And I was really worried, yeah. but honestly, we, we grew like crazy that year. And so even through the recession, we were really strong. We were, we were hitting record sales every year. So year over year, we've hit record sales uh, ever since the first year we've grown. And so I, it seems like it I'm seems really, like no matter what, people still want pizza at least once a week. Pizza, no what's pizza is resilient. <laughs> I mean, true. look how many times I've had pizza this this month. It's a, I mean, pizza is resilient. <laughs> it's true. Pizza is amazing because if you look at what what a pizza costs, even the best quality, most expensive pizza on the market, it's still a value because you can feed your family. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that it's communal. You can share a pizza. You're not all individually ordering something different. There's just something really warm and 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 great about that, that you can order a couple pizzas and you're feeding your entire family as opposed to, you know, everybody getting their own meal. And so I, I always say, you know, you can come to Park Street and feed your family a, a nice meal for $30 by getting a couple pizzas. And where else are you no, going to do can't. that? No. <laughs> you can't even get two so, meals for, for that. <laughs> right, right. And so... Yeah, I'm, I'm, so speaking back to the concepts, um, so we're looking at doing a Park Street carryout as our, our next leap into another nice. town. And so that's kind of a project that we're working on now. And that project was in the works pre-COVID and it's still in the works, but it's, it's getting delayed a little bit. Um, but it's going into a newer development in an area that I'm really familiar with that's close enough it's still within reach of our original spot but it's going to allow us to to kind of gain more traction in that area area and to so still be able to use alleviate. the hub for that uh okay yeah gotcha. absolutely it's about 15 minutes from our nice. hub and um and it's going to alleviate a little bit of the pressure from our original store because at certain points we just can't capture everything all of the demand and so i think it's going to help you know, one of my goals with that is to help service. So service doesn't suffer during peak times when people can't get through on the phone, they can't, um, wait times get too long. Uh, service maybe is, is, uh, you know, not as good as it could be because the team is just so under fire. So we're thinking that it's going to definitely help. So we're still working towards that, but the dine-in concept has definitely been put on hold for now. And we're going to reevaluate that. Probably as a good idea. Yeah, no <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. For sure. yeah. When we were there, we were talking with you about the fact that your area is very tourist driven, but it seems like you've been able to still just rock out sales during this, during the COVID time. Um, you mm -hmm. know, have you kind of established a new customer base? Well, we've never originally in the in the first three or four years of doing business, we never had any tourism business. We were a, a strictly local based. I mean, we were our our customer base was all locals, and we do have we're we're fortunate to have in our area. We're at the heart of Amish country, and so we do have folks coming from all over the state of Ohio, from Pennsylvania, Indiana, West Virginia coming into our area for tourism, uh, things like furniture sales, Amish restaurants, um, Airbnbs, uh, all, all kinds of stuff like that, Amish theaters, things like, there's a lot of really neat things in our area. And so since we've been building on our dining room, we've, we've acquired a lot of tourist business as well. So, but we're a really nice mix. So tourism is really hot from about May through October, and it's really big in the fall. But we stay strong and, and pretty much almost all lo uh, local customer base in the off season. And so we don't really see any, any decrease in sales. We get a little bit of a bump in the summer months, mm -hmm. but really we p stay pretty consistent year round. Oh, that's great. So, what, so when you had to pivot with COVID, um, did you change your menu any? Did, uh, what, were the, what were the steps put into place that you, you, know, you guys did? Yeah. So we were fortunate because we were, you know, we're based as a carry out and delivery business. Mm -hmm. um, pre COVID, we were almost 50% dine in. But as far as our restaurant goes in the menu, the menu is pretty much all ready to be 
served, carry out, and delivered. Yeah. So we really didn't have to pivot the menu much. We adjusted our hours. Um, we didn't we didn't lay anyone off. We kept everybody working at their normal amount of hours, but we adjusted some adjusted some of our hours down a little bit. We opened up our delivery radius a little bit uh, wider in order to keep um, a little bit more shifts open for delivery drivers and basically just to try to capture a little bit more of the business that we were losing from dine-in that we thought we were going to lose. But it was, it, we were really fortunate because, because of the uptick in demand for carryout food and the fact that so many other restaurants were closed, we were able to keep our normal numbers. Even some weeks we were up numbers. Um, wow. And, and we're seeing that now we've just reopened the dining room last week and our numbers are, I mean, the dining room has not been overwhelming. Uh, we're still doing a lot of carry out and a lot of delivery, but it's, it's definitely helped. And our numbers are up from last year quite a bit. That's outstanding. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess we reduced the hours a little bit and then staggered them back in I'm trying to think of other adjustments we made. I know one thing we did was when we started to realize we were going to be okay, as far as continuing business, one thing I wanted to make sure we did was try to compensate the staff for what they were doing for their part, because I just felt so grateful that they're, they weren't bailing on us. You know, they wanted to be there. They wanted to work. They wanted to keep serving guests. So we instilled a, a bonus, a $20 per day bonus per staff member for uh, the month of April, I believe. And that was something that, you know, we did to try to incentivize our team to, to hang in there and to just be grateful for their jobs because, you know, everyone was scared, everyone was at risk and we were doing everything we could to protect them. We went to a couple other modifications we did. Uh, we slowly pivoted to hundred percent curbside service for a couple of weeks. So we just, every week we would take a couple steps in one direction and then the next week we would do another couple steps. And so that allowed us to kind of learn as we were doing it instead of all at once. Yeah. Just yeah. All at once change where everybody's freaking out and nobody knows what's going on. You seem to be a guy that just keeps a cool head always. <laughs> <laughs> I, I try my best. Most things don't bother me too much. I mean, obviously this whole COVID thing has been, you know, kind of unnerving well, you would have to be an absolute robot if it wasn't unnerving. <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> right exactly but yeah i mean you know I, the way i look at it is you know we're gonna get through it i love to problem solve things so i just look at that as kind of a challenge so when something comes up that we can think through and figure a solution out for i'm i'm game to try to be a part of that and and i'm really blessed to have courtney as as a sounding board and and, and a great thinker she she has always has a great perspective on things. Uh, but we've got some other awesome people in our organization. Uh, Chad, who's our general manager at Park Street, he's been uh, general managing. He took over my general managing spot a few years back. And I kind of finally let him take the reins on that. But he is truly a systems guy. He's a numbers guy. And so uh, he's been able to, you know, take my systems that I had working really well. We had a you know, people always said, man, you got a well-oiled machine here. Well, when Chad, when Chad got in there, he really made it a well-oiled machine. And so, you know, with people like that on your team, it's just, it's easy to feel confident that we're going to get through this and we're going to figure it out. Yeah. Now what, where are you at as far as dining? Uh, you know, this now by the time this airs in another week and a half, it, it'll probably change. It could be at 125 <laughs> by then. Who knows? Or, but, you sorry. know, all the way back down, who knows? Uh, uh, but where are you at right now? As far as yeah, like you're dining. Yeah. Are you, are you back open to any capacity dine-in wise? Yeah. So we had our health, our, uh, our health inspector in about a month ago and she gave us some really good guidelines and, and understanding of what was required, best practices. We made some, we made some modifications to our dining room. We put up, uh, I, I wanted to keep it to where it, it still felt as pleasant and unscary. And so you didn't have like uh, you know, like police marking tape on, on some uh, booths and <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't do that. To, I, we, we did some marking on the floor to kind of direct traffic okay. and help people understand where to stand when they order and where to wait and, and what the flow is going to be coming in and out of the restaurant. But 
in the dining room, I wanted it to feel mm -hmm. like a calm, pleasant experience that people were still familiar with, that they were enjoying with their family. So it didn't feel like, you know, I'm sitting here in a restaurant and I'm scared for my right. life. Yeah. I don't want that. You, you so, wanted them to be aware that, hey, you guys are taking steps, but also not like thinking about it every every yeah. you know bite you take <laughs> absolutely so yeah we didn't we didn't put plexiglass on every booth fortunately we have high back booths that the health department said you know what these these meet the standards they're fine oh, wow, that's so good we we did have to clear out the center part of the dining room and what i did was i actually just made some some family tables because we can have seating up to 10 so i made i put some of our four tops together to make seating for larger parties and we're only gonna obviously not more than 10 but they're spaced out enough that we have six foot clearance between everything. And then we took some of the tables we weren't able to use. And I just bought a bunch of really cool plants. And I made that like a planter area nice. right in the center of the dining room to kind of just have green space there, which makes everybody feel good. Yeah. It creates barrier and it just adds to the value and the feel of the dining room instead of takes away. And your dining room so has great light good. too. So I, you have the, is it the, the skylights or the side, uh, the side windows yeah, that come mm -hmm. in? got a lot of lot of natural light we've got huge windows on both the east and west side of the dining room we've got big french doors that open into the patio and then we do have skylights so the skylights were the reason for all the plants because i'm like we're gonna have great light for these plants this is just gonna be perfect yeah are you able to use your patio right now and your porch because i know you have both <laughs> yeah yeah the patio and, the patio and the porch are both open we've separated and spaced out the tables um just, yeah, this, that was the first thing we opened. We actually opened that up first and ran that for a couple of weeks, uh, spaced out and limited. And then, so that's probably been about three weeks ago. Uh, but we've been trying to stay, I, I don't want to be the first place to open things up and really force that. But again, it was just being present and understanding where our team was at, what their comfort level was with the service type. And then understanding the needs and hearing the guests and listening to them and, and seeing what, what, what was, what they were asking for. And one of the reasons we opened the dining room was we were getting enough people looking for it, coming in, wanting it, that it wasn't one of those things like I want to capture these sales. It was more of a, this is just going to help the flow of customer flow and traffic because it was almost to the point where we were having so many people coming in, picking up orders and then going outside and sitting and crowding things because there just wasn't, you know, we almost just needed to create more room for them. So this way it's, it's allowing people to stay spread out and, and not congregate and, and it take, take some of the pressure off the carry out. Yeah. That, that sounds uh, like a great plan to a great plan to go through. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people are, you know, the cleaning um, guidelines and things. You know, are are you having any issues with PPE or uh, making sure that your staff has everything that they need? Uh, not really. Um, we've been fortunate that we've been able to source all the all the supplies needed. Um, we have, we were actually really fortunate. We had a local company that donated. It was a, a local uh, a women's clothing company that they make uh, like women's clothing by uh, Amish seamstresses. Nice. And the owner's just an amazing person. And she reached out to me right at the beginning of this and actually offered to donate masks for all of our team. This was before people were wearing masks and masks weren't. Uh, really socially accepted yet. And she dropped off a hundred masks for us. And so our team started wearing masks about a week or two ahead of when the governor was requesting that everyone starts to wear masks. And so we, we had a jump start on that. Um, we've been dedicating, we've been, we've been running higher labor for sure because we are staffing extra people to do nothing but clean, to be really proactive about, cleaning, sanitizing, not only tables, but credit card terminals, touch screens, door handles, bathrooms, fountain machines, all of those things. So just having that intention to, you know, have someone there to take care of those things has been huge. Yeah. And that seems like it's a, probably a long-term um, strategy for, uh, for the foreseeable future, I think. Yeah, definitely. The way we're utilizing people and some of the ways that we want to serve uh, folks is 
definitely changing. We had a, a beverage station because our, our concept's a little bit unique because you come in and you order at the counter, you go to, you go sit down and we bring you the food. Drinks are self-serve. So it's kind of a mix between a, a regular dining establishment and a, and a like a fast casual. And so we had to remove basically everything from our beverage station. Uh, we would have like custom uh, urban cheese blends that people, we kept on tables for folks. Uh, self-serve fountain drinks with like syrups. Mm-hmm. And I remember those syrups. Silverware. Just, yeah, all, yeah, all of the different stuff, just the fun stuff that people really enjoyed. Now we're having to kind of keep all of that stuff back and we've gone to all single serve things just to kind of try to eliminate any cross-contamination concerns that there could be. So we, we're wrestling right now. One of our staff members actually just brought up the fact of, do we want to be handling silverware because we've always tried to be a really green restaurant and, and think about the impact of disposables and things like that that we use. But so we use real silverware in the dining room, but do, is that best practice to have people handling dirty silverware, mm-hmm. bussing tables and washing stuff like that? Or is that maybe right now something that we should look at going disposable temporarily in order to eliminate just that? that potential threat to, to our team members right. or, or potentially to our guests. I mean, obviously we're using a dishwasher with um, sanitation capabilities and everything. So that's not, a cons- I don't think that's a concern, but at the same time, you know, you are eliminating a threat by just not right. having reusables. Yeah. Wow. So those are some things we're thinking it's about. It's a lot to think about with the business, right? Oh. <laughs> Man. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, we get to see you soon. Josh, tell, tell, tell everybody what's yeah, happening. So, um, yeah, just if you've gotten one of the most recent issues of Pizza Today, you saw that we announced that Rocky will be one of our keynote speakers at the uh, 2020 Pizza and Pasta Northeast in Atlantic City. So congratulations on that, Rocky. Thank you. I'm super excited. That's going to be a lot of so fun. So give us a little no. taste. What are you, yeah. what are you, what are you going to talk mean, about? <laughs> I'm sure you haven't oh, fleshed it out entirely. I'm sure, you know, but uh, you probably practice a little bit in your mirror so far. But uh, yeah, what, give us a little taste of what, you know, what, what might be going on. Well, I think, um, you know, for me, my passion really has just been finding my own way in business and and not not setting I guess not, not falling into a standard practice of what people think a restaurant needs to be. Um, and so because I didn't know going into creating a restaurant, I kind of, we, we developed our own pattern of thinking for how we staff, uh, how we manage, how we create menu items, how we grow, how we develop leadership. And so I'm just excited to talk about some of the things that I think are unique about our organization and ways that other operators can can really think about theirs in, in maybe a different way. Because there's just I've learned so much from from coming to Pizza Expo and going and listening to other speakers and reading about in about things and taking that information and kind of funneling it through my my process and then u- using it in a, in a way that I can. I can do that and it's unique to our organization. And so and uh, you guys mentioned a lot about details and I think that's something that I'm really passionate about is looking at those fine details and making your establishment something that is, is, is unique and it's special. And so many places I feel um, have, the, have the potential to be super special and to make a, an impact with folks and it's just a few small tweaks that they could make. And it could be the difference between a guest wanting to come back or not coming back. And so I think if I can enlighten folks to some of the things that I've learned over my 17 year career uh, of, of things that have been impactful for our, our organization, that's, that's some, that's some stuff that I'm passionate about and really excited to share. Oh, well, you've, uh, you've sold me Rocky. I'm yeah. going to be there now. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. Awesome. Yeah. I'm excited to hear it. So <laughs> that's amazing. So cool. yeah. So, uh, you know, everybody look out for your July issue of Pete's today. Uh, He's in Rocky the is June. right there on the cover. Oh yeah. no, it's Jul- July. 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 Uh, sorry, oh. July issue. I'm losing no, my I'm, mind. Well, you know, when you're home for the last three months and you <laughs> exactly know, it all runs together is, right now. 
time makes no sense anymore. So, yeah, but it is the July issue of Pizza Today that Rocky's on the cover and writes an amazing essay inside. All right. Can't All wait. All right. Thank you so much, Rocky, for coming on the show. We appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. It's, it's truly a pleasure to talk to you guys. And you guys are an inspiration. The magazine's just such a great resource, and I really appreciate it. Likewise, buddy. And uh, we'll see you in October. See you then. Okay. You guys take care. All right. See you, Rocky. Thanks for joining us this week on The Hot Slice. Special thanks to Rocky Chanower for talking with us. Next week, we sit down with Mike Bausch. Make sure to visit pizzatoday.com and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts so you'll never miss an episode. And while you're at it, rate us and review us and share the episode. And as always, thanks for listening to The Hot Slice. We'll see you next week.